This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Where in the world can we find beauty? We know that we can find it in art, in music, in love, in sunsets. But can we find beauty in the death of someone we love? Can we find beauty in the pain of our own child? Can we derive pleasure from the worst things that have happened to us? My guest this week says yes, so long as you have the right ideas. This is my interview with Daniel Coffeen. I am in the home of the intellectual who knows nothing, the great Daniel Coffeen, the, the wizard of Renegade University, the, uh, the entrepreneur, former academic, brilliant writer, someone who touches me deeply with his writing, his ideas, his way of life. I got to share a story before we even start. I uh, asked him for some of his writing before I came over here. I said, man, just send me some of your blog posts to read just to give me just to give us some frame for this conversation. And he said, all right, here's a couple. And I'm in the car on your on the way to your house and I'm reading the first one. And I, I got about halfway through it and I started crying so hard I couldn't even <laughs> get to the goddamn house, you fucker. That's a good essay. Jesus good Christ. Essay. So it's about your son and it's about your sister and it's about other things. It's about the pain that is pretty normal, actually, that, that, that ex is experienced by everybody, but you, you think about it and talk about it in ways that are, I'm going to say nimble. I'll take nimble. Does that make sense? Yeah. That it, and yeah. In, in being nimble with these extraordinary um, feelings of sadness and pain, you offer some freedom for me as a reader. Yeah, that's nice to hear. Yeah, I mean, that essay, was, it's the title of his vulnerability, Yeah, um, was really, so it's not as much about the pain per se, of course, right? It was about a state of being that the pain brought on, right? The pain sort of allowed me access to something. And it's humiliating to be, you know, pushing 50 mm -hmm. and discovering vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Right. Tell like me about it. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's where I am. That's exactly. my life these days. It's so funny. Right. It's, it's so humbling. Um, you know, we, I think people like you and me, we cruise through life, little smarty pants, little smart asses, we're clever, we're, we're white, middle class, yep. everything kind of flows. Yep. And then all of a sudden, you know, in another essay, I call I talk about the scaffolding, right? The scaffolding of your identity mm -hmm. and the scaffolding of your practice. So for me, you know, for everyone about caffeine and, you wake up and you think you're a certain thing. Being for me, it was I'm the I'm the smart guy. I always have the smartest guy in the fucking room. And meanwhile, it's all drug fueled, you know. <laughs> and I'm increasingly as my as my energy begins to wane, I take more and more things. You know, not all illegal. So I use the word drug to mean sort of everything. Um, the sort of the, the technology of inspiration. Mm -hmm. so, high, so high powered intellect, good with the words, good with the writing, good with the talking, good with the reading and thinking, and just like a lot of people in the feelings department, except as I said to you before we turn the mics on, one of the top questions I get about all this postmodernism stuff and even just philosophy generally and just being intellectual actually is what good is it for you in your, yeah. in your day to day yeah. life? And what I'm saying to you and to the audience is that if you read this essay called Vulnerability on Daniel Coffin's website, you will see, I think, a way the way in which that these ideas about relativism and postmodernism and the subject and the object and having a choice in life and agency and not just being stuck with what is given to you, I think you will connect 
these very, very high, high polluting idea, high polluting ideas that are often presented in unintelligible ways. You will see it presented in a clear, precise, short, brilliant essay that I think will actually make you feel better in your life. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the it was always my problem with the academy. I remember when I first, I almost didn't go to grad school, right? I, I, I was, you know, I got very excited by theory at the end of my uh, college. And all of a sudden, you know, this is, this is mid 80s, right? And I'm quoting Derrida and Foucault, super sexy man, mm -hmm. right? And so it was, became this identity I could sort of have and I kind of, and I was good at it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we mm -hmm. were the cool weirdos with the black sweaters and mm -hmm. no one really heard of this stuff, deconstruction. And, and then I, and then I didn't, you know, I started, I tried living in Europe, I got bored, I toured all around the country, I had my heart broken and, um, and then I applied to grad school, but by the time it came time to go, I was like, I don't think I want to go here because I'm not sure these ideas are right for me in that they're, um, they feel alien. Mm. And I want to, I was want to live life at the time I was sitting in a, I was living for free in a basement in the lower hate district of San Francisco. I bought a typewriter, drank a lot of whiskey, smoked a lot of pot and just wrote this kind of deranged, surreal fiction, whatever came to me. Hmm. And it was, I was very inspired by Burroughs and Kerouac and this combination of the two, that freewheeling, but surreal. And I was like, I don't want to go to the school and then have all the things that I love. And in the meantime, I'd studied Kierkegaard and I read Kierkegaard on my own and had been very, 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 very influenced and very emotionally moved. And I began to feel that the intellectual uh, was no longer, that, that didn't make sense, this intellectual, it was about a life lived. Yeah. And that's what Kierkegaard's all about. Mm -hmm. And so I, I ended up going to, to Berkeley because they offered me money and I was fucking broke, you know? And, and it's like, okay. In the very first semester, I, I was taking this class on Kierkegaard and, the, and I just couldn't, I, it, the teacher was, everything was so abstract, I just couldn't stand it. I just, I was like, I'm gonna drop out. And I met my advisor, <laughs> who I didn't know yet. And he was like, drop out of that class just do what you want, just write for me and we'll talk about it. And I began to realize that ideas for me, I didn't see the distinction between ideas and life. I, I could fall into that and I had a temptation to constantly fall into that, to, to enjoy the sort of, again, the pyrotechnics of a Deleuze and Guattari or even Kant and Hegel and just see them as these gossamer architectures. And I really, really enjoyed that and mm -hmm. I was good at it. Um, but I was always bringing it back increasingly to a kind of passion and to just, what is my life? How do I live this? Does it, does it get me fucking hard? Does mm -hmm. it get me excited? Does it light me up? Does it, I, I didn't need it yet to make me feel good. I wasn't there yet because I was confident and young enough and ebullient enough, but I still wanted to feel something. And then to be honest, I, I, I decided I could not write a dissertation on William Burroughs because he was so close to my heart. I refused to do that to him. You know, so mm -hmm. I wrote about a whole theory of rhetoric and difference. And I was like, it's just easier. Yeah. I can satisfy the academic conditions, yep. but I also kiss an academic career goodbye because even in my dissertation, I make jokes. I, I personalize. I couldn't, I kept running, bumping into other academics because I, it just didn't share what I shared. They always wanted to take an idea I had and go, oh, that's just, that's just a loose notion of the rhizome. I'm like, yeah, but Jesus, fuck, there's really any way into this life and this text? And do you really, I'd be jumping up and down out of my seat. And they, there was this kind of tension between what it felt like my body infused with these ideas and their lack of bodies, their absolute yes. absence yes. of their bodies yes. being involved. Yes. And of course, you see right now the Puritanism and all that stuff going on campus. Of course, they hate the body. They, That's it. They hate sex. They hate life. <laughs> it's and so I was so relieved to leave it. Yeah. I called it a tomb. I, when I was in it, I said, this, is, this feels like death to me all yes, around. Exactly. So your essay, though, yes, it begins not with any of this. It no. begins with a discussion about one person who's very important to you, your son. And you are, as we've been discussing, have been your entire life a person of words, of books, of reading, of sentences, of putting sentences together of putting many sentences together into paragraphs and then paragraphs into essays and then essays into books. That's what you've been doing pretty much your whole life. That's where you live. You live in those words. You feel comfortable there. You are a master in that world. You are the wizard in that world. Your son has a hard time reading, it turns yeah, out. Yeah, my little dyslexic genius moron. Um, really has a hard time. And it- Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not even that 
He's not like a terrible dyslexic or anything like that, but he's dyslexic and he does not like reading. Should I should I read your essay? What what? No, the <laughs> yeah. way you described his experience yeah. when the kids in his class started well, that's, learning. That's what happened. I was sobbing in a cafe, you fucker, because yeah. of that. Okay, it's really moving the way you described it. Well, and it, just, it I don't have. I've never had yeah. a kid with learning disabilities or yeah. anything like that. And it was the first time you describe it so beautifully and heartbreakingly that it's hard to get through. Yeah. But it was really hard for you. It was devastating. Had man. to be. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, here's this kid. He's really cute. He's sort of precociously social and empathetic and smart, sort of sought after as this little boy. And he was just sort of a deer. And he's in first, second grade. I can't remember when they're really doing reading. And I can picture it happening in the classroom. You know, they started doing this reading. He's always the little smart guy raising his hand, answering the questions. And all of a sudden, he literally had no idea what they were doing. They're all, everyone's looking down and they're doing something. He, and he came home and the look on his face of just going from being just this confident, happy kid to just everything, the world is dropping out from him. Mm -hmm. Just feeling alone and confused. Didn't know what he could tell us and not tell us. And it was, it, it, I, again, I, I wrote in that piece, I think about that moment that I still think lurks in him. And it, it's becoming this sort of challenge for me to, in parenting because he won't, and that's what the essay is kind of about, trying to get him to just be, feel vulnerable mm -hmm. about it, especially as a teenager now in a tough public San Francisco high school where he just wants to be the cool dude, yeah. you know? And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I don't give a shit about any of that, dad. I don't care. And I'm like, that's, there's a kind of fronting, you know? And, and that's what that essay was kind of about. I just wish he would say, this kind of makes me feel shitty. Like, what do we do? And I'd make him feel as good as I can because I, I, I'm like, it doesn't really matter. There's all kinds of things. You're a genius in all these other ways. You're visually precocious. I mean, you can weave together elaborate scre uh, storyboards and films and sees it 20 scenes out. And, right. right. In this unbelievably bizarre skill he had at a very young age. Right. You said to him, this is in your essay, yeah. you said, imagine if film were the dominant language, everyone else would be dyslexic. Which is true. Yeah. Because he's, yeah. Uh, based on what you've said, he's got lots of genius in him. Yes. It's just not on the page. Yeah. Or in the page. Yeah. And unfortunately, school, I used to tell him that every single day I'd pick him up. I picked him up every day from school. Every day I could see it on his face from like second, third, fourth grade. Just this kind of deep doubt, self doubt. And I would pick him every day, I would tell him, you know, he had some spelling tests. Well, he can't do well spelling. Math tests. Well, fuck. Num numbers are worse Impossible. than letters. And I was like, well, they happen to be testing you on all the shit that used to matter and they, they think matters, but they don't test you on anything you're good at. Let's imagine it was the reverse. And every day trying to get him to feel like it was okay and take him to this, you know, reading all these theories of dyslexia that argue that it's not a dyslexia, right? It's a, it's a, it's an advantage, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, you know, a lot of Silicon Valley's into this shit now, right? Cause right. he scrambles all these categories and he's a natural creative thinker. We used to have the deepest conversations about philosophy and infinity. And, right. um, he understood time in these incredibly complex ways, but I know deep in him, he still has this kind of that moment where the whole world fucking fell away from him. Here's the moment. No, you write, he is afraid to be left standing there as the world gives way and he doesn't know what to do. He can't just say to me, quote, dad, this is scary and weird and makes me feel bad, even though part of me knows it's irrelevant. And then you write, which is to say, he is afraid to be vulnerable. Yeah. The thing about this is that a lot of people, given such a situation, will just sit with it. And oh my God, my son is not differently able. Don't tell me this deep in my heart. I know he's, uh, he's disabled. He can't do things. He is unable to do things that are normal and good and make you happy. Well, right off the bat, let me say something. First of all, I have found out just generationally, my son stopped reading about three years ago. Mm. Does he know stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. He knows a lot. Is he smart as shit? Oh, yeah. Just like your son. One of the guests on this show, Nick Hazelton, was 19 years old when I interviewed him. Smart as shit, knows all the stuff in the world. He doesn't, I found out in the middle of the interview, it shocked me. I said, of course, you've read all this. He said, no, it's all from videos and, podca and <laughs> podcasts. That's interesting. Okay, so yeah. that's the first thing to say to your son. Yeah. Can I name him? We can. Yeah, sure. Okay, so Felix, yeah. To say to Felix, but then much more importantly, I think, is the deeper question. And it's, this is really the freedom that your philosophy, my philosophy, our ways of looking at the world really offers, which is this. Yeah, differently abled is actually, yes, it's annoyingly politically correct, but it is very much the way one can look at this. Yes. And one can even look at Felix as being, in many ways, superior. 
yes. to the rest of us because he simply is objectively yeah. according to their own standards, right? Yeah. But mostly, I guess I want to say thank you for just demonstrating that someone from the world of academia who thinks the way that I do, who reads all these books that many people find irrelevant, incomprehensible, can write a paragraph and an essay like this that is accessible to just about anyone who can read. It's moving and it made me feel better. And it actually made me think the next time something like this happens to me, I know that I can think differently about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Fucking I really, idea. I really, and we haven't even gotten to the rest of this essay. There's another even more painful thing in it that you dealt with. And I know it's hard for you to talk about, but you keep offering a different way. You can just situate yourself differently in the yes. world and in your mind. And it's, it can all be good even. Yes. Felix, I didn't know he was dyslexic until today, Daniel. You yeah. didn't tell me that. You told me that he had an issue with learning and that's why he was going to a special school, but I didn't really... But that's beautiful because what I knew about Felix, what I was telling everyone when I, when I tell people about you is, oh, he has a son who's like a, a genius filmmaker and he's really creative and a cool kid and he's into all these things. And that's what I knew Felix right. as because you have written that narrative for him. Yeah. And that's the narrative I'm sure is that it seems to be in your head because it certainly didn't seem fake to me. So you, you have a narrative, you have a son that you built in your head named Felix, yeah. who's a beautiful, brilliant boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, you're right that the, um, all that, all that beautiful, for lack of a better word, postmodern thinking is really, it's just like, there is no center. There is no one idea that's right. So what does it mean to be disabled? I, I, it's ridiculous. It's just, it really is just otherly abled. Yeah. Right. And exactly. perhaps even superior, but in either any way, it's just, it's simply when you really just see the world at, without a standard. And you begin to see it's it, these emergent standards, yeah. right? Just just make make it up, right? You know, the, rather than ever beating him up to make him feel like he was suffering or had to go through this, it's like you know, fuck, fuck reading. It's so anachronistic, man. You know, learn video game stuff, learn videos, learn. You know, there's so many other ways around this. And he is afraid to be left standing there as the world gives way. You write, and what you're saying now is. That was a moment of terror, but it was also the moment possibly of Felix's liberation. Exactly. It's that free fall. It's like when you realize and you stand there and you have no scaffolding, yeah. no ego, you're not tethered to anything. Now, of course, he was only five or six or seven years yeah, old, yeah, yeah. so it hit him maybe a little earlier, but you know, all of us have been in moments where we think the whole world is falling away, haven't we? Yeah. And what I'm saying here is that you and this way of thinking have allowed me in those moments to think... Oh, this can be an opportunity just as right. much as a crisis. It right. can be freedom just as much as being stuck forever in this situation. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's really beautiful. You've also told me, and you, you turn in the essay to another really, really, maybe the, I think it's the most painful thing in your life so mm -hmm. far, right? And we've talked about this without a doubt privately. Yeah. So your sister died Yeah. six years ago now, I guess. Yeah. yeah right? Six years ago, November. Yep. In the essay, you said that you couldn't stop crying after this happened. I just want to say thank you for this. To be speaking of vulnerability, you said that you were crying on the street in front of strangers, right. in front of baristas. But note that in this particular moment in this essay, I'm arguing that I'm not vulnerable at that moment. Right. I'm sad, mm -hmm. but it has a certain cultural currency so that I was, I wept everywhere. I wept walking down the street. I freaked out in front of my son an incredible number of times. Um, mm. I mean, just shrieking into pillows and... Mm. Mm -hmm. I used to have to, I had to learn about pillows. My neighbors wouldn't call the police, you oh. know, but yeah, walking down the street, but I, but I always felt, and I was had to constantly travel. So I was on airplanes and just in front of strangers constantly. I was in hotels because she was in New York. So it was back and forth, staying near the hospital, staying near her rehab, all that crap. But the point of that essay is the fact that I wasn't vulnerable there because everyone recognized it. So yeah. I'd get all this sympathy, all this, you know, some people would cringe and walk away, but I had a, I had, a, I was located within the cultural fabric, mm -hmm. being sad, mm -hmm. grieving, grief has a place. It makes people very uncomfortable. And I wrote a ton about grief. Um, and I have a lot to say about grief mm -hmm. and, and it does make a lot of people very uncomfortable, but it's still situated where vulnerability is precise. The lack of situatedness, right? right? It's, it's the world giving way. Right. And, in, and it wasn't until after all that, after my sister died, after I was done traveling, after I was done crying in front of strangers, when I was alone with this pain, 
that my ego began to just sort of collapse and my scaffolding could collapse, yeah. right? Because I didn't have that tether. I mean, this is an incredible mm -hmm. thing. I write this in another essay about the difference between somebody dying and somebody being dead. Um, dying, everyone, everyone's there. It's this intense experience, mm -hmm. right? And then they're dead. And then you just go back home. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to call my mom with an update anymore. She's not calling me in the middle of the night with this or that's happened. Every, everyone goes back to business and then you're there. And in fact, grief actually gets more and more intense over time. Each year it gets, in a way, not worse, it gets more profound. Really? Yeah, because the absence. She's okay. still not here. She's still not here. Yeah. And so it's this constant, for me, it's a constant sort of uh, uh, evacuation of ego, evacuation of, of place it, uh, situatedness because I'm it no longer situated. When she's dying, it's situated. Oh, this poor young man was relatively young then. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, his sister's dying. Oh, you know, how are you? How, you know? And then, and then she's gone. And then, then you're left. That's that moment where the world gives way. And I don't have this tether anymore. She was my main tether in this life. She's clearly the, the only person who loves me, ever loved me completely. You mm -hmm. know I mean? And I, I wrote a lot about this more than any parent. You know, my brother, hmm. we're very close, my brother and I. Um, but my sister was just so m maternal in a way, my parents, you know, my fucked up upbringing, you know, just never could have been. And there's, there's also sibling love versus parental love. Parental love is finally kind of judgmental. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not living up to me. You're not living up to, you're not doing the right thing. What are you, little shipper? My mom always yells at me, your beard's too long. Or, you know, what the fuck? Don't, don't, don't take those drugs. My sister just loved me no matter what. No yeah. matter what. Right. No matter what. There was no question. Let me say this. Your sister's dead, but I envy you for that because I never had a relationship really of any kind with my brother. Yeah. Just none. I just never connected with him. I still, to this day, no one has died who's really close to me, who I really cared about. My father died three years ago. Um, I still have not shed a tear about that. So, which is good. Don't, I mean, that's, that's a good thing. That's not a sad thing. I have not, I simply have not had this experience of losing someone then that way, who was that close to me. And I wish... I had wished my entire life to have had a sibling <laughs> <laughs> who could die, <laughs> who could, who could know, who could, you said, right, who was always yeah. there for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the pain I don't envy because it has to be monumental. Yeah. But I don't, you know, it's, but, so okay. there's a few things there. One is, um, you know, I wrote an essay on Thought Catalog. I don't know if people know Thought Catalog, a 20 something emotive site. I respect and very much like the guy who founded it. Um, but I wrote an essay titled, the incredible gift of watching someone you love die. Mm. And I open, I'm like, yeah, I wish you bought me tequila, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but instead she gave me your death. And so rather than just being this grief, I was like, let me, I'm going to learn everything from this. I'm going to lean completely into it right on. to understand death, to understand, like she, you know, and then my, 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 my guru Buddhist shrink, old Jewish psychotherapist, Zen. I know exactly who Rajni, that is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, I've known 50 of them yet. He, uh, you know, I remember I go to see him and I'm a wreck. I finally decided I need to see someone and, mm. and I was just, I couldn't get off the couch, right? It was months and months later and I just was still crying all day, every day. Mm. And I go to see him and he's like, oh God, oh, it's beautiful. I'm just, mm -hmm. he's like, that's just gorgeous. Oh yeah. Oh God. How lucky are you? He's crying with me. I just, this is, the, this is beautiful. You're the luckiest guy I know. Yeah. His sister was here. She's not here. It's okay. It's beautiful. What else? She yeah. taught you to die. That's right. Your big sister. Of course she taught you to die. What a, how lucky for her. How lucky for you. You know? And it was, uh, I was like, fuck, huh? And it began to flip around. I actually wrote another essay at the time about good grief versus bad grief. And this, and that, that, that abyss, that emptiness becomes a kind of fullness mm. in mm -hmm. grief, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's not painful. It doesn't mean I don't weep. It doesn't mean if I could take it back, would I? Could I? You know, if there's something I could do to have her not have died, of course I would. But that's idiotic, right? So then if she's dead, you, you lean all the way into it. Yeah. You know, it's not about getting over the pain. It's not about getting easier. I'm not interested in that. There's a fullness in your life that yeah. people actually envy because of this. Yes that's come out. I discovered yeah. that I, there's something about you I envy because of her death. Yeah. I now know why. I didn't know why you were so sad about your sister. I just knew that she, I mean, I figured, well, your sister dies, you cry a lot. Yeah. Now I kind of know yeah. that she was that presence for you said maternal and always there yeah, and yeah, un my, unconditional, yeah, unlike your judgmental six years parents, older than me. Yeah, yeah. six years older, but just yeah. that presence that you know is always there. You lose that. Right. Um, yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. I get that. And the thing is though, what you're doing is living, man fully in ways that most people don't, you know, and not only living, but you're being, cr here's the thing. 
you're being creative with it. You're taking death and you're being creative with it. You're making it not just one other new thing. That was your shaman, Buddhist, Jewish therapist right. was just one option. And I love him for that. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. But when I was sitting in that cafe just two hours ago, weeping over this goddamn essay, you fucker, <laughs> when I was trying to pull myself together to come interview you. I told you I sent one just for you. Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, Give me a little yeah. heads up next time. Yeah. That's what I felt too. I was sitting in that ca cafe so thankful for you. Hmm. That's nice to hear. And so thankful because it was, I felt like, damn, man, I have a friend who lives this fully and I understand what he's saying. And I feel like I might live this fully too sometimes and we can share this and I'm about yeah. to go to his house. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's spiritual. I think that's, we connect over and, this. Yeah. I think we've always, we, I think what we share and it come back to the, these ideas, right? Like that was, that was sort of the separation for me from academia, right? Is that Precisely. I, for me, it was a full living. Precisely. I didn't separate. So my sister dies, I read Deleuze, I read Burroughs, I watch a film, it's all the same. It's just, it's, it's fueling me in some way or it's not. And I, there's a reason it's not fueling me and I'm going to dismiss it and go some, in a different direction. Mm-hmm. But it's always fodder. It's never extraneous. It's never just a veneer, right? It's all about, you know, I. It's I, about you, goddammit. Yeah. It's about me, motherfucker. It's about us. It's yeah. about my life. It's yeah. about people dying and bleeding and suffering and kids not being able to read and being humiliated standing alone in a classroom. It's not just about these abstract ideas and abstract ideas and words and words and words and words. Yeah. It can be, but that's what's called a university. Yeah. Where there is no life. Yeah. We're about life. We're about living. We're about words that we care about. We're yeah. about words that are connected with things that we call feelings. And we know that we can actually change our feelings with our minds, though. Right? Yeah, we, can think episode, about, yeah. we can think about the worst things ever, yeah. like our sister's dying or our, or our son who's beautiful and not being able to read. And we can make it, and it is. We just did it. Yeah. We made those things into beautiful things, and it's only 26 minutes in. Hey, how about that? It's efficient. Yeah. It is efficient. I was feeling like shit in that cafe about a bunch of stuff in my life. And I was like, no, God damn it. My life is so beautiful right now. Look what yeah. I'm doing Yeah, because of that. Because you just said, look at it differently. And I did. And I feel so much different now. I didn't know if I was going to come here and just be a bawling mess with you. Yeah. Yeah. Still time uh, uh, there. Yeah. Well, who knows? We know I'm famous <laughs> for this. All right. So you wanted to, of course, and then you're, and I'm telling you, we got to talk about the personal stuff. It's what people want to hear. And you're like, nah, nah, nah. They want the intellectual stuff. I'm like, no, man. You just made the point though. Yeah. This is what sets you apart from every, all those assholes across the Bay in Berkeley. Not all, but most. They're dry and lifeless. Go to one of their lectures if you think we're making this up. You know, you've been in their lectures. Yeah, your example. So I just wrote this essay just called, uh, just like two days ago, called Fear and Loathing in Academia. Yeah. Uh, and it's about, and I was like, you know, it, pick up any piece of academic writing. We've all looked at it. At some point in our lives, we had to read some academic writing. Has anyone ever read something? And we know this thing called academic writing. Hmm? Has anyone read this and been like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> 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 this is filled with pleasure and vitality. Yep. We all know. And, yep. and my naivety when I was first starting out was like, oh, this is just an accident. I didn't, my diagnostic <laughs> skills weren't so keen yet. And I was like, oh, just, I'll just ignore all this and I'll get to the other stuff. And I didn't realize that this is... The people making the shit, there's a reason their bodies make this shit. Yeah. They're these kinds of bodies. Yeah. They don't have joint vitality. They don't, they take everything that's beautiful. Deleuze, Quattri, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, all these things that just turn me the fuck on, make my whole life different. Poetry. And they just, they, mm -hmm. they suck the life from it mm -hmm. until it's just dead. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you dare mm -hmm. try to reinfuse it with vitality, mm -hmm. they kill you. Mm -hmm. That's why you're here That's and I'm both here, here. And we're <laughs> not in classrooms. <laughs> exactly. They didn't want us. Now, let we me ask you this. Down the toilet. Let yeah. me ask you this. I got a whole lot of anxiety and, and stress over this. And I know you do too, but yeah. are you glad or not to, About, be, to be here and not there? You know, um, I, what I, I still have this ideal mm -hmm. of, of the Academy. Mm -hmm. And I realized in this piece, I think it's kind of funny. It was just like, it, I realized it comes from Animal House uh -huh. from Donald Sutherland with the scene where they all get high with him. Uh-huh. And he's talking to the student, if I, what you're saying is we could all be living in the now of, you know, some giant God in, in our own now. Yeah. And then next thing you know, he's sleeping with his mm -hmm. grad student. You know, it's just like, well, this is the life for me, man. It's pleasurable. It's, it's vital. It's, and then, you know, and I loved teaching and I love teaching undergrads, graduate students. Yeah. It's, it's actually one of my favorite oh, yeah. scenes, throwaway lines in 30 Rock, which is mm -hmm. one of the more brilliant things to be on television, um, where they're, she and whatever, Alec Baldwin, they're talking and they, 
they say someone's the worst and those those are the worst people and they both look at each other no we both know who the worst people are grad students <laughs> uh it's because all they do is professionalize they're so yeah. nervous yeah. and they're there to professionalize the thing you love yeah undergraduates are awesome because mm -hmm. you teach them some idea i need you i'm more fati love fate oh my god their lives changed mm -hmm. they come to me they're like coming out of their skin they're so excited you mentioned in a grad summer well that's just nietzsche's notion he borrows that from spinoza it's like what the <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> Who cares? That's not what I'm saying. Professionalizing it. That's exactly the word. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By doing that, they reduce it. And yeah. by doing that, they also, when you professionalize, you're, you're, you're removing yourself from it. That's exactly right. That's what you do when you put on the business suit. Yeah. You're making yourself, you're putting your personal life away yeah. for the day. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what they do with ideas. Yeah. That's what they do with ideas. And in fact, they, it's systematic though. It's not... Um, it's not an accident. It's not this or that professor. It's the institution, mm -hmm. right? It's premised on scholarship. You have to cite everything. Mm -hmm. You have to read all these other academic writers. Your dissertation is supposed to cover the literature mm -hmm. in your first chapter of all the other writers, and I refuse to fucking do it. Me so too. in my dissertation, I don't have one secondary source. <laughs> my whole bibliography is like 20 books, right? It's like, what about Nietzsche? What about Deleuze? That's about it. That's about all the entire bibliography. So they knew. Yeah. My advisors who loved me, they knew I was never going to be an academic. <laughs> They just were like, okay, dude, go do what you're going to do. Thank God. But I didn't know that. I was like, really? Won't everybody just love me? Because I'm a great fucking teacher and I'm smart and I can write and I can write like a fucking banshee. Mm -hmm. I can write you 10 books in a year, you motherfuckers. Like, I I'm your dream. And I, and I taught the shit out of those motherfucking classes at Berkeley. I grew that major, became this cult following. And that's why they canned me. Mm -hmm. That is, I was called a demagogue. That's why they canned me. Precisely because I was successful. They called you a demagogue? A demagogue. A demagogue? Yeah. Because students were coming to the major for me. I mean... And they paid me nothing. I did it I not for a living. I did it out of, for, as a hobby because I love doing it. Because you're, that. You're, you were a demagogue because you infused your lectures with some feelings. I mean, yeah. a demagogue in the true sense, the real definition is someone with, with ulterior motives who's right. trying to manipulate people into right. a particular, you know, to follow a particular path or usually it's about politics, right? Yeah. About, it's about manipulating people and lying, people, lying to people to get them to do something in politics or something. Right. Please, everyone, go listen to Daniel's lectures. I mean, yeah, he's using emotions and feelings, but... What you, were you trying to lead them to? It's like, yeah. it's nowhere. I mean, well, except I was trying to, I was very explicitly trying to seduce them mm -hmm. into this way of thinking. Absolutely. Into an op just being open and enjoying this mode of thought. That was my fucking job. Right. It know? wasn't about making them into socialists or conservatives or yeah. Republicans or Democrats yeah. or Marxists yeah. or even postmodernists, yeah. right? Yes. It was just about. And this is what rhetoric is the introduction of the major. This is what rhetoric is. It's about it's play this. and pleasure and yeah. fun. Which is what I think, I think rhetoric is the art of all those things. So I was like, this is, this is, this is it. Um, and they loved it. It was hugely successful. And I grew the major, I grew money into that department. Yeah, that won't, now, that their, won't do. We to their that. credit, they probably were a little worried about lawsuits and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I just couldn't believe this. Again, it's the systematic eradication, mm -hmm. evacuation, eradication, elimination of passion of vitality, of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Your writing can't be pleasurable. You know, I'll talk about a, 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 a well-known professor of mine up there was, was Judith Butler, who, to her credit, you know, when you read her writing, to me, it is, um, it is just painful. I mean, she's just, a, I don't know if she's a shitty writer. She for, chooses for people to who don't like know, that. Judith Butler is probably the top, one of the top two or three sort of postmodernist intellectuals in this country. She's yeah. a super famous in this world. And her writing is notoriously indecipherable. I, there's a friend of mine who's sort of a fan of hers and has a lot of similar ideas to me. He was like, yeah, man, you got to read Gender Trouble. You got to read Gender Trouble, which is her classic work. And I was like, it's, you'll see yourself in there. And I tried. And he said, I don't really see. He's like, no, go to page 33. There's the second paragraph. If you look, if you squint really hard, and so I'm not kidding you. I'm like, yeah, I can kind of see where she's saying, like, you can choose your own gender and that's cool. But man... But then, it's so tough. I studied uh, randomly. I took a, we, we had an independent study, about four or five of us, and we all read Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. She happens to be a, a trained Hegelian. Yep. And watching her talk about Hegel was gorgeous. It was exactly why I wanted to be in the academy. Mm. It was, 
she'd get kind of glossed over and get kind of, almost like channeling. It was almost like speaking in tongues. It was Damn. gorgeous. Hmm. And I'm like, fuck it. She taught me that book. And it really, I, I was like, these and that great a, moments. That's like one of that. the hardest books yeah. ever. Also. Yeah. And yeah. I, I wouldn't have any way into it. I still don't really understand it, to be right. honest. But I wouldn't have any way into it if she hadn't clued me into these incredible, beautiful complexities. And she clearly took a pleasure from it. And then I, what I couldn't ever understand is how then that translated. And, you know, she's, she, she's very aggressive. And she, I'll say this out loud because I, I think she would agree into the, the professionalization of the academy. And mm -hmm. She came to the rhetoric department that I was in that was really unprofessional. We were just all studying crazy, wacky shit. And she showed up my second or third year. I can't remember. And it was like, I'm going to professionalize this department. I'm going to get everyone to get jobs. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. And, and that sort of sucked the joy out of what had been a very heavy drinking hmm. Uh, psychedelic, very nutty department. Hmm. Um, and she was very open about that. Hmm. Um, so no wonder you had to go. Yeah, there was no place for me. Personally, we got along just fine for a while mm -hmm. um, until I was her colleague, adjunct colleague, and then things didn't go as well. But hmm. yeah, I, so there were these moments of joy somewhere in there that I miss, right? And I love teaching. God, I love the classroom. And you know, the little sh increasing, you know, I started teaching in 1992, finished 2008, and I watched, so I was teaching as a grad student, that's how they pay us. Mm -hmm. um, it was great, because we're not even TA, we're teaching, it's our class. Right. Um, and I love those classes. Me too. And I watched the students get more and more, it's a little shipperty, you know, more and more entitled, more and more mm. wearing their flip-flops. You know, I, I, I talk about it in my novel, like, they're like trying to click the channel when they see me talking too much. They're like, there must be another channel. There must be, <laughs> can I get this right. somewhere else? But there were always enough, easily enough, just fucking lit up awesome students. People I'm still good friends with um, to this day. You know, now they're in their 30s and I go out with them and they're smart. And I knew them when they were 18 and they're just, they're, they're geniuses. Um, and I miss that moment. I miss teaching undergrads. I miss the life. I wish I could just have be tenured and have money coming in and lead this life. But I know the reality of it is unbearable. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is I've engineered my life so that I work very few hours a week. I have incredible freedom. I can write anything I want about anyone I want. I got to write my book. I didn't have to cite a goddamn fucking thing in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wrote. I quoted someone. I didn't quote them. Sometimes I make up quotes. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. You know, I love quoting Nietzsche based on memory. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not a scholar. Fuck you. I don't care. <laughs> well, you are, but you're not a scholar in the ways that they want you to be. Right. You know those books inside and out, and you have tremendously right. sophisticated takes on them in the way that academics do. You're just better at it. You're just nervous because I'm doing that Nietzsche class for you. But uh, <laughs> I do know those books inside and out, but I love... And I do at certain times cite, cite, but I like no. But I'm gonna, beautiful things citing by memory. But let me tell you how yeah. radically I'm not scared. Yeah. Here's how radical <laughs> this fucker is. <laughs> you actually, I love this. In you told me this in classes when students would ask you a date, like when, <laughs> when something happened or something, you would make up the date. Oh yeah, because I mean, there's a real reason for this. This wasn't just playing. It doesn't around. matter because I was teaching them the death of the author, death of history. I didn't care. You we were, were teaching to them teach a certain kind of reading, the text, yeah, not the context. Exactly. You were teaching the text, not the context. That's exactly how I taught philosophy, even though I'm a historian yeah, yeah, that's funny. and we are trained to that's do exactly funny. not that, yeah. but I understood somewhere and I was originally really a philosophy guy anyway, and really am always, but I did that. I said, let's, let's do this in a vacuum. I know you're not supposed to, but I'm telling you it's going to be way better. Otherwise, when I, if I situate this text in a, in a context for you, what am I doing? I'm writing the text for you. Exactly. I'm telling you that exactly. Nietzsche wrote this because of what was going on in Prussia in the 19th century. How do I know that? Yeah. You know, you're, I'm now giving you a way to read it. I want you to read it for yourselves, yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. And be creative yeah, with yeah. it. I'm just keep putting, I'm putting limits around it if I tell you yeah. when and where and why and how. Well, this is, you know, this is the entire argument of my book, right? Yes. This is all I taught, right? Exactly. And, I, and, I, and there are other ways to read mm -hmm. that make sense. It's sometimes context is super important of and course. illuminating and all that crap. It's just not what I was teaching. Exactly. But they would always instinctively raise their hands and be like, well, who wrote this? When did they write it? I would just make up a name, make up a date. It didn't fucking matter. I'd change it up. It didn't matter, right? Let me, let me throw this yeah. at you. Does this make sense? The more context you give, the, le the less agency, or the more agency you're taking away. Yeah. From both the reader, the reader and the, and the historical yeah, you're subjects. You're determining the text. You're situating it. Like we were talking back to our earlier conversation about being situated, right? Not being vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing about reading, mm -hmm. the way we're talking about, is that you're vulnerable. 
But that exact moment of vulnerability where you don't have recourse to historical context, to the secondary source, to grounding it in something else is your fucking freedom because you're the authority. You don't need anything else. Just tell me what you think. Yep. And that was just this incredible moment for students. And I think people still have this moment with my book, which I love, which is you don't have to read the writing on the wall when you're looking at the Picasso. Just look at it. You can say, you know what? That shit's ugly. This bores me. Beautiful. Who it's, cares? Yeah, Walk but it's away. It's terrifying, man. To but be alone. To be alone. Right. You're telling them to be alone and it's going to be okay. Yeah. And they're saying- Not just it's going to be okay. It's going to be beautiful. beautiful. It could be. Yeah. It could be. Now, what they're thinking, I'm sure, is, wait, I don't know how to make sense of this. I'm going to look stupid. I yeah. feel stupid. Exactly. I'm looking at this page or this painting and I can't make heads or tails of it. So that means that I am nothing. I don't have what he has in his head. I must be just an inferior person. Right. I'm imagining that's very common. I think that's exactly right. They're afraid yeah. because yeah. now, you know what's happened? You just threw them out of the house. Yeah. The context is a home. It's a house. It's a structure. It's boundaries. Nice. It's mom and dad telling you what is and what isn't. Yeah. And you just go through life with the context saying, oh, when I see this thing, I know what category to put it in. You have yeah. these categories that have been given to you. You, on the other hand, a real teacher, a real teacher says, no, 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 no. The first thing we're going to do is tear down the school and the house. And I'm not your dad. In fact, I'm the opposite of your dad. In fact, get the fuck out of here. Go stand in front of that painting for a while or go, or yeah. go, go look at Hegel's writing for a while and tell me how it feels. Yeah. How about that instead? Yeah. Yeah. And it's good. The home thing is great because it's, um, to me, I, it's a figure you come back to all the time and, in, in, you know, one, one definition or way, one way I've explained to say postmodernism is that there's no home. It's nomadism, mm. right? Which is a great figure to lose in Guatri. Is mm. You're the nomad. You're always home. You're never home. There's, mm. It's the wrong question. There, you, there's no tether. You're not going back to something. There's no hometown. There's no... We're all in the diaspora. There will never have been a fucking Zion. Like, get out of that mentality. It's all this free movement. Embrace your diasporic nomadism, right? And in that, there is this incredible liberatory beauty. So... The second, pretty much, I stepped onto a college campus the first time when I was a 19-year-old freshman at Antioch College in Ohio, and the grass was green, and the girls were pretty, and I got to read Plato for fun. I knew this was the life I would needed and was going to have. Here's what it was. I was going to have a three-bedroom craftsman house with two children and a wife on a leafy street in Berkeley, which happens just happens to be, by coincidence, where I'm from. <laughs> that was going to be my life forever. I was going to have tenure. And it was going to be beautiful. Well, none of that. Well, it did work out for a while. It turned out to be hell. I was trapped. I had to escape. And I did. I jumped out of the comfortable airplane. And I've been f trying to build a new school and a new house while I'm falling yeah, ever that's since. Good. Yeah, yeah. That's a great definition of postmodern, too, is building your house from within the house. Like while you're falling. Using the hammer to build the hammer. Yeah. Right. That while I'm circle. falling. Yeah. Out of the plane. I yeah. got I'm not just not a parachute. Yeah. I got to build a new place to live. James Baldwin, one of my smartest students at Barnard College. I don't, but I haven't been able to find the quote, so I don't know if it's true, but she said that James Baldwin once said, you'll always be homeless so long as you don't build a home for yourself hmm. inside of you. Inside, you'll always be homeless, yeah. right? right? So that's what, whatever we're calling this postmodernism yeah, yeah. thing is, right? It's, it's, you can build whatever house you want inside. It's yeah. narratives. It's stories about what's but, happened. But you also want your house to be... Um, you know, not so fixed, right? So the, having the narrative exactly. be this flexible, endlessly morphing thing. And so the narratives we build, you know, I call them narratives. A figure I started using, I stole from my good friend is up in Portland, is, is this scaffolding, right? Mm -hmm. is this, and I know other people abuse this, but it's a really useful figure because it's supporting you. And you have these narratives. And, um, you know, you go through life. I've you know, at, at, at our age, you start realizing you go through a certain, you go through these experiences where you're like, this is, this is who I am. I know who I am. I'm going to do these things. I'm this professor. I'm the smart guy. I'm going to do these things. And then something gives way and you kind of collapse and you, then you come up with another narrative. Right. And I've been through that where I thought I was the wonder boy with this good upbringing and then re rejected it completely and then hated my parents. And then it's like, well, that's an idiotic narrative too. Right. And it, it, you're constantly rewriting. And then you get to the point where you're like, well, fuck they're, I don't need a narrative. I'm constantly working on a different narrative. It's a narrative that's endlessly morphing. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a beautiful freaking thing, you know? Um, and that's, I love this figure of the nomad, right? And I come back to it often, right? The, you're always home, you're never home. Right. Home, you know, I think the Elvis Costello, right? Home is anywhere you hang your head, you know? Um, claim it. 
for the time being and then let it give way. Right. You don't cling too tightly. Yeah. To any it's narrative. the future. It's the terror of the future. Yes. That is the bourgeois condition, exactly. you know, I think actually yes. to be Marxist for a moment or, or sort of Pomo Marxist to yeah. me, that's very much what happened to us as a, as a, as yeah. a species about 200 years ago when they invented time and really started enforcing it is the future became this big whip. Uh, over all of us. Nietzsche claims it's going to begin with Plato and the Jews, sure. right? And Judeo-Christianity, right? Yeah. That they're going to... But they just, they just yeah. weren't good at it until right. the 19th century. The 19th <laughs> century is when the factories were built and the clocks right. were actually put on the wall in front right. of people and, and, and they were taught how to tell time. Until yeah. then, the peasants mostly just ignored it and, and woke up when the sun rose or the rooster crowed or whatever, right? This is really the 19th century with big government and big capitalism and, yeah. and time, mostly. Yeah. It's really, fuck capitalism. Let me, libertarians out there, I've said this to you, it's fuck capitalism and the state, it's the, it's cultural. Right. To me, the big turning point was the invention of time. I've said this in front of audiences. It's the yeah. clock yep. and it's the terror of what comes next that yep. they use against you to make you do all kinds of things, yeah. right? Yeah. Whole save, culture. Yeah. save for the future. Don't yeah. indulge in the yeah. present. Um, you know, it's so you, the more you think about the future, the more anxious you are. Yes. And some of us collapse from the anxiety, but a lot of Americans, it turns out, just work really hard from the anxiety. And so that's why we have all these bridges and buildings and rocket ships yeah, and yeah. tanks is because with all that anxiety, because of the future, because of time, we've been working our asses off. Yeah. Not to mention the threat of God and his punishment for being lazy. Yeah. So anyway, sorry about that. No, tangent, no, no. But that's exactly. I think that's right. I mean, that's it's funny thing about Nietzsche. That was Nietzsche's whole argument was that. For the Greco-Romans, they live in the moment. They are beautiful. They mm -hmm. don't need, they're not aspiring to a goal. They're already fucking there. They're there. There's nowhere to go. That's right. This is it, man. This is the apogee. I, personally, this yeah. body right here, this cock, this face, this, yeah. and I am, the, I am And there. they're standing under the Greek sun or the Roman sun yeah. and like- And then you get Plato the and, Mediterranean the, and the sea. Jews and yeah. they're like, I, I can say the Jews, right? Because mm -hmm. you are one? Because I am one. Um, and Nietzsche has great respect for the Jews because they overthrew the Greco-Romans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> it's all this fear-based stuff, right? I, I have to strive for something. I gotta, I gotta please daddy. Mm -hmm. Daddy God, right? I got to yeah. constantly satisfy some condition I'll never quite satisfy. It's understandable being Jewish to be afraid of God, because if you read the Torah, man, it's nothing but mass murder, pretty much every other sentence, yeah. you know? And so I understand why the Jews are so anxious and have yeah. been and how, why the Jews gave us this yeah. thing called anxiety yeah. and this thing called fear of the future and this thing called fear of the unknown. It's like, that's why every Jew I've ever fucking known, including quarter of myself and my mother and my son and my ex-wife and all the rest of them. Yeah. I think have suffered from this thing, but then it got systematized when the yeah. Protestant capitalists took it over. Yeah. Max, Ve Max Weber said this, right? Yeah, it's like, good. oh yeah, all that anxiety about the future, the capitalists got a hold of that and the Puritans got a hold of that and they made us work like yeah, that's mofos. Nice. And that's next smart. thing you know, we got America. That's smart. Thanks. Yeah, I like that. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's one narrative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's also, that's just something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Every time I come to, the, as I drawing these, I, I've been, because of you actually, in my, since meeting you, pulled me a little more into public discourse mm -hmm. and thinking about some things. And, and, and I haven't told you yet about some of the ways you've really been influencing me. Oh, right? yeah? Yeah. To the point where I actually occasionally go on these libertarian rants <gasps> against people. I'm Ooh. not a libertarian, you fucker. Uh, yeah, neither am I. But yeah. I want to use this, but I don't know, I don't know the right word, right? This, yeah, yeah. And I, and We're I, inventing something new, brother. Yeah. We are. Yeah. yeah. And I, I like the idea of this idea of liberty, and you've given me a great, you, one of the smartest things you ever said to me that really I think about all the fucking time is um, freedom is freedom from responsibility. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, Not yeah. having to fuck it. And, I, and that's, it's, mm. I felt that in my bones for so many years and you articulated it. Um, and it's complicated and I got to think of, I'm thinking it through these days. Felix and Toby. Yeah they're not going to be big fans of that idea, right? Yeah. That's the problem for me, our yeah. sons I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Being a, being a father. <laughs> oh, right. Of course. That's the big, we yeah, really, yeah, yeah, that yeah, was yeah, not the yeah, thing yeah. to do if you are seeking freedom from responsibility. Yeah, but my kid gets it though. It's funny. I asked him, I feel kind of bad about this. I asked him the other day, I don't know, we were watching some movie. I don't know what we were talking about. And I asked him whether he thought he would have kids. Mm -hmm. the first time we've ever talked about that. He's just into girls now and doing stuff with them and all that. So we talked about it. And uh, he's like, no, he goes, they look at you, dad. Don't you, don't you, don't you wish you were just free? Yeah. That's, that's what my son's been saying to me lately. And too. I was like, well, I said, well, no, I mean, yes and no, but I, I wouldn't trade this for anything. Right. This love, this intensity, this, you taught me how to be free. 
it was this, it was a vulnerability around you that tethered me to a certain responsibility, mm -hmm. but also blew me wide open, inaugurated that vulnerability. I would never have had that experience okay. really. Yep. Right. Except what can, what pathos more than my sister dying. My, my sister could die if I never had a kid. Hmm. My guess is it would mean something very different, but the incredible pathos around parenting around children mm -hmm. is so mm -hmm. resonant. I mean, it feels like the DNA, you just mm -hmm. tremble in ways and have fears in ways and think in ways that, you know, um, and the, and the fear thing is interesting because I'm trying more and more to, I'll tell you an incredible story about this. Ready for an incredible story? Always. This, this is a story that terrifies me. Okay. So I'm seeing this shrink, right? This 80 something year old, he studied with uh, Osho. Oh yeah. He never, he didn't tell me too much later about that. So he just. The Rajneesh guy. The Rajneesh, who, who, who I'm a huge fan of. Fans of the show will know about this, yeah. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of, yeah. of, 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 of Osho. Osho. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he's mm -hmm. helped Which is fascinating to me too, yeah. He's smart as fuck. Totally okay. surprised yeah. me, but that's great, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I'm talking to the shrink and he's, and he's, and we're talking about, we talk a lot about death and ideas and and he tells me the story um when he was living back in new york he was part of some group that would get together and talk all these jews and one of the one of the guys in the group was a was a lubavitcher jew a hasidic uh a part of the lubavitcher ultra, sect ultra orthodox jews. ultra orthodox yep. mm -hmm. um and you know had like a, a lot of kids and his kid he guy had like a five six year old kid who was sick needed like a little kidney or something and then the kid died and Bob, my shrink, sees, sees this man a few days later. And the guy is as joyful and at peace as ever. And my guy, this is long before he's met Osho, right? Says, what the fuck? And the guy's like, he's with God. Mm. He's, everything is as it should be. Mm. Which is what my shrink always told me, right? To the point where um, my kid was going through some anxiety around my sister's death right afterwards. He was having some eating issues and he wasn't eating and he mm. was sort of withering away a little bit. Mm. And I was a wreck. I was filled with anxiety and, and I was writing my son and you gotta, you gotta eat, you gotta eat. And he just didn't, he was afraid. He had phasmophobia. He was afraid he was going to choke to death on all his food. Right. So I, had, I was putting out smoothies for him and just mm. cans of soup. And, and my shrink says to me, well, what's your fear here? What's the worst thing that happens? And he made me say it. And I was like, well, he dies. And my shrink's like, and you, your sister died. He's going to die. We're all going to die. What difference does it make? It's okay, too. Okay. About three days later, he calls me. I shrink on the phone. That was an intense, he has a thick, hilarious, beautiful New York Jewish accent. He's like, that was an intense conversation. I want to see how you're doing. Make, try to make sense of it. He says, uh, well, I've been thinking about it. And I'm right. Hmm. You don't got anything to worry about. He's like, he goes, I'll be honest. I met your kid. Your kid's going to be fine. Like he's, I see the genius in him. He'll work his way out of it. Leave him. The, just leave him alone. He curses as much as I do. Leave him the fuck alone. And sure enough, that's what I did. And Felix slowly worked his way out of it. I didn't even notice the day he started eating normally again. Because I just totally let go. You let go. Totally let go. That's and his mom, to her credit, totally let go. And we just, I put out tons of food for him. He could just eat, because he was like 10 years old. I mean, he could get his own power smoothies and anything he wanted, but I stopped making him meals. I stopped asking him to eat them. Whatever you want. You want to eat that stuff? You want, you just take care of yourself. You'll figure it out. And he didn't, I, he didn't die. He did not die. My right? son. Yeah, he did not die. He did not die. So and in you, fact, he, he is healthier than ever. He so worked you, his way out of it. You let him go. And he came back. Exactly. You let him go and he came back. Yeah, exactly. Your fear is, was of losing him. Yeah. You get him back twice as strong. That's the Kierkegaard's line, right? Yeah. You kill your son, you get him back twice, twofold. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's me. I mean, in a way, my a fear of abandonment. Yeah. So especially that comes out with all my intimate relationships, including my son and my, all the women I've been with. I just assume they're not coming home right. when they leave yep. for the day. I assume in, deep in my bones. I'm the same way. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think we share that. They're yeah. just not going to come deep and, in. And you don't blame them. You're no, like, well, of course fuck, not. Why would they come no, I'm back? I'm expecting it. <laughs> yeah, they, it's, good, it's good for them. In fact, know. I judge them for coming back. Exactly. Really? You come idiot. Why, you want to be with me? Yeah. No, but that's it. I And the deeper in love I am with someone, uh, the more I feel that, you know, especially in the early, I can get over it, but early yeah. on, it's like, I'm just assuming you're not coming home. Totally. My intellect knows you are because you have a job and you have this house and you have to come home and the food is here and your car has to be yeah. parked here and all that. Yeah. But like, yeah. no, fundamentally in my soul, you're not coming home ever. Totally. And so when you 
when you let someone go like that and they come back, that's when I really cry. Yeah. Moments like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had, you know, I've had many moments, of course, including with students. I remember there was a student I had. I was a, it was a, she was a black woman from Brooklyn and I was, I was a brand new grad student, teacher at Columbia. And we, I, we had a really, I thought we had a really good rapport and we did. And I was doing all my radical shit about slavery and blackness and like create, you know, that gets me in tons of trouble. And she was getting it. And I was just falling in love with her in that way. And it just seemed like this amazing thing. And then, then there was some moment in a classroom, I forget what happened. I said something and she got really pissed off and really worked up. Didn't like storm out, but like was really upset. And I was, I was just, I remember feeling like mortified and I had to talk to my shrink about it. Not because I was going to get in trouble with the PC police. This was like in the early nineties before that stuff was really a big deal. It was really like I developed this bond with this person and I felt like she was not coming back to my class. I felt like she wasn't going to come back the next class. And when she did, when I just saw her come back and she acted normally after that and everything seemed to be fine, it was just the most moving thing. I still remember this. This was in 1995 or six or something. And I still remember that Mm -hmm. because she was one of the first tests in a way, right? I sort of like didn't have anything to do. She got mad at me and I couldn't reach out to her because it was, it would have been weird. So I just had to wait. Yeah. I just had to wait and see if she would come back. And she did. And I was like, oh, maybe other people will come back if I let them go, let them work their thing out, whatever it is. And maybe there isn't even a thing, but it's the letting go that is so hard for everyone. I I think, you know, I I, I brought that all up because I think um, talking about our notion of freedom and child and being parents. Right, freedom is freedom from responsibility and parents and that tension. And what I'm was moving towards is letting go of that, not worrying so much about my kid. I have the responsibility, but I, I don't have to fix everything. I don't. He's gonna work it out, mm-hmm. and I just treat him now as if there's so. Parenting culture is built on worrying. Mm-hmm. My mother always says, "I'm your mother. I'm allowed to worry about you," mm-hmm. and I, that was ingrained in me. And I sometimes I find myself leaning into that with Felix, and then I'm like, "Fuck that." Mm-hmm. I'm, you know what? And I told him, I'm not going to worry about you. Not because I don't love you. Precisely the opposite. Yep. Because I love you and I respect you. I think you're a, and this is what my shrink was constantly saying. He's like, he's a human being. You don't, you don't got to do things for him. Respect his, he didn't use this word, his agency, his life. He's a genius. He does more than you. Back the fuck off. Yeah. And that's why I told him, like, Felix, I, he has all these troubles with school. In fact, I'm making him change schools. Um, partially because he's an adolescent, you can't see far enough ahead. And he's made enough stupid decisions at this public school that, are, that I don't know if he always sees the implications of. And I could just let it go. And in fact, as I could, and I resigned myself to that. But then on really selfish levels, like, no, I'm going to send him to other school so that I don't have to think about that. I don't have to deal with the conversations with his mom, who I love, and handles it very beautifully. But we don't have to keep talking about his homework and whether he's doing this. And just they'll take care of all that at the school. He's going to do what he's going to do. We even have we even have data on this now. I mean, yeah. basically, it looks pretty clear that kids end up where they're going to end up regardless of their schooling and their parenting. Yeah. It's just that they're going to have it's, it's the question of how much difficulty and trouble along the way they're yeah. going to have. But I think there's a whole bunch of data now that suggests that what we do between the ages of five and 18 don't have much to do with where they end up. Yeah, totally. The worrying thing. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. And guilt and shame, right? Which yeah. is like, well, guilt, especially with parenting, right? That's the, that's the, one of the major feelings we have. I had a shrink tell me a really beautiful, important thing. This is how simple it is. She says, exactly what is your son bene- gaining from you being worried about him? Yeah, exactly. How what is he? How is he benefiting from you exactly. worrying and feeling guilty yeah. that you're not with him right now or whatever it is? Yeah. And I was like, oh, I that's right. It, it produces zero value in the world for me, for him, for anyone. My guilt, my worry, any of it, right? Yeah. It does nothing. In exactly. fact, as a matter of fact, it does produce negative value in the form of like the thing your mother said. Yeah. Well, I'm your mother. I get to worry about you. Well, that's just punishment in a way. That's exactly. just in prison. That's just controlling. That's just making you feel bad for her now. Exactly. So it's actually a gift to your son or whoever it is you feel worried about or guilty about to not exactly feel this is guilty what I'm saying and that's why I'm just rediscovering them. my freedom in in as a parent by not being worried or anxious and just saying I, I don't have this incredible responsibility he's responsible for himself sure practically speaking I, 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 you know I can keep him afloat and give food in him and sure. all that crap but my touch mm-hmm. is becoming lighter and lighter and much and, and I'm I'm 
because of who I am. I tell them all this, right? I let them know this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, and I was like, dude, you're... What you got to do, too. Yeah, yeah. you're mm -hmm. 15. You're kind of going on, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I'm happy to help you. I'm here for you anytime to talk about shit. But I I've abs I trust you. I believe you. I think you're going to work it out. You're anxious. You're going to figure it out. The school thing, I would let that go. I really would. And this, I'm not quite sure why I'm not. This is this is Nietzschean parenting, yes. is it not? Yeah, it exactly. is. Right. Yes. Instead of the coddling and the structures yes. and the comforting and the which is all lies. First exactly. of all, it's all a fat lies. The world is full of murder and death and blood and torture yeah. and rape and all that. Yeah. You know, um, and it's also limiting. It's restricting. That's it's controlling. Exactly. It's manipulating. Yeah. It's not love. If that's love, then I don't want any part of love. Exactly. Exa that's exactly what I'm saying. So I think that this, this, what we think of as a dichotomy between freedom and parenting is a false dichotomy. Mm. Like, there is this other place where I am absolutely myself, he's absolutely himself, and we go together. I'm not that's taking it. care of him. We are moving together. I love now we just walk through the city together, man, checking shit out. That's what I do with my son too. Yeah, it's just awesome. What's the, what's the problem? That's what we try to do. I mean, that's where you we're, know? yeah, I mean, he's still, we're still struggling with this, but that's where I'm going with him. Yeah is we're going to be two, you know, full individuals, hopefully. Yes. Yeah, you want to always agree, you can fight, sure. love, I goof, mean, play. Now we're always going to be their dad, right? Yeah. And there's always that, but not in a state of indentured servitude, essentially, exactly. or, you know, psychological indentured servitude is what it is. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. That's brilliant right there. Was That's it? exactly right. Yeah, because we tether us. We think by being guilty, we're doing good. By worrying, right. we're being a good parent. Right. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Talk about the, one of the greatest dupes pulled over us. Now. Yeah. Yeah, so the I agree with you. worrying is parenting. Now, what the fuck? But here's how bad it is for you and me, though. Yeah. So you and I are now working through this. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who, but the problem is our goddamn sons have now internalized it. So now they're worrying about us. I know that Toby I, worries uh, about me, and you just told me that Felix worries about you. Yes. It's, and and, I, and I feel and, bad about that, because I feel like... That's why I feel, I feel guilty about that, because I feel like I... He's, he's seen me be so vulnerable yeah. and he worries and, I, so and I'm trying to get him to let go of me in that yeah, yeah. That's what I'm dealing with that's right brilliant. now. Yeah, yeah. So my son's right out, he's just about to finish high school and he's really worried about me right now because of stuff that's going on in my relationships. Yeah. And it's like, what the hell, man? Why? It's not even your business. You're about to leave and go have a bunch of girlfriends. Why are you worried about me? Yeah. So he's got infected with the damn thing yes. and now we got to get it out of his head. Yeah. Right? And same with Felix, I yeah. think. But fundamentally, I do think that for both these kids, there's an empathy, which is beautiful. That's right. Right. That's and right. They, and they do see us as human beings. That's right. One of my mantras to Felix growing up was, I told to him all the time since he was little, and it's sort of obnoxious, but I stayed with it. I was like, I am a fucking human being. Mm. I'm not just your father. I am a man. I have mm. desires. I do things. I have interests that have nothing to do with you. And I would say that to him. I was, and when he would pull a little shit or thing, like little kids do or whatever, yeah. with his mom would be like, she's a woman. Yeah. She's doing things in her life. She's an artist. She does all kinds of things. Right. You are not a fucking everything. The like, respect us. The smart ass listeners will right now be saying, ooh, caffeine just essentialized himself as a man and as a, as a, yeah, you just said, I'm a human being. I'm a man. I have feelings as if they were like inborn. Just want to clarify that. But, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I don't know. But the yeah. the thing about you're saying that there, so I also don't really believe in empathy. I, but there is, some, I'm just going to say this about what, Toby demonstrates and what it sounds like Felix demonstrates that we love about them is just, they care about us. Yes. That's it. Like he cares about me. He has yeah. feelings yeah. for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. And that is in itself what I love, I guess. And also that I'm, in other words, I'm choosing to love that he could be a complete narcissistic cut off person. I could choose to love that too. Sure, sure, sure. But I just want to say it's yeah. not. Oh, I natural or part of their oh, no, no, essence. It's just that you and I are choosing to love that about them. Oh yeah. But I, my kid sounds like your kid, Felix, ever since mm -hmm. he was really little could size up the room from babies. Mm -hmm. He knew right. the baby who needed help. Yep. Kid who, and so all a poor kid, all through public school, he was always stuck with the troubled kids because the teachers always knew mm. he's not going to complain. He's not going to fight. He's going to be good with that kid. And so all the little screwy kids in his elementary school always invited him to the parties because Hmm. Everyone invited him to every party. He was invited to every fucking party. And the screwy kids loved him, and he loves him. He doesn't care. He's, he, he, he's, he has a, an empathy that is um, much stronger than mine. He, he feels a room, and he feels what other people are feeling in a room. That's what I mean by empathy, obviously. Right. So let's go. All right, so let's do the deep intellectual annoying shit. Because yeah. I have this thing. I have this whole critique of empathy. I don't know if you've heard me do this. But, yeah, no, yeah, so I don't, I don't believe in it. I mean, um, 
I, I don't know what to do with this, but it just doesn't make sense to me. If you have our way of thinking, um, how could I possibly know what's in your head? No. Oh. Now, what I'm thinking is that it's mostly projection or all projection. Now, again, that doesn't discredit it. That doesn't mean it's not important. And, and but I do think that's essentially what's going on. I think that you disagree with me. You're shaking your yeah, head. Yeah, I do. Good, good. Because I don't. Uh, maybe I, maybe I don't want to think this, but I just find it to be sort of the height of like modernist arrogance to think that we know what's in someone else's head, that our feelings match the feelings in someone else's head when we can't ever have a real transcript or a video of what happened there. And often we also know that in communicating one's own feelings, we change, we change what happens in our heads, right? With through the communication. So I, I'm very skeptical of this empathy oh, that thing. Is, that and, is, that and why are you abandoning we me, got, Mr. We, Postmodernist? We got we to correct some things here. First of all, you're talking about evidence it. of things. The okay. whole point is that we live without recourse to evidence. I don't, there's no, of course, I don't mm. know. There's never going to be that nice. knowing. Nice. All there have to go on is the fact that we are all made fundamentally. We can talk all we want about personal sovereignty and agency, but that's just a political stance. In reality, we are all continuous. And we are all part of an affective, conceptual uh, realm. Where I, I walk through the world. The world is relentlessly affective. And I am affective. And the cosmos, the energy, everything's flowing every which way. And we are just, we are all participating. So it's not a question of I need to leap from me across an abyss to you to feel like you. It's that we are all going together. So to me, that's how I teach reading a book, reading a person. You lean into them. It's not, you can see how their world goes. I can see the shape. I can see what they're thinking. In fact, we had a whole conversation earlier about some people in your life these days and mm -hmm. You, the way you were sizing them up, you could read them mm -hmm. because you're feeling, not what they're feeling, but you're feeling with them, right? It's compassion, it's co-passion, it's feeling together. And it's not about unity, it's not becoming one, but it's about we are over the same fabric, just essentially, we just are. And that fabric is endlessly differentiated from within and there are all kinds of internal limits. But we are also all of the same stuff. You know, uh, Joni Mitchell, right? We are stardust. We are gold dust, right? We are three million year old carbon, right? Um, right? We just are. And so, and there is no tether. There will be no, no movie, no mm. slow-mo replay. Yeah. Which is another thing that drives me ape shit. as if a slow-mo replay is the real thing that happened. There is no fucking real thing that happened. That's just a new reality. Anyway. So listeners will be happy to hear yeah. that I am in not... I am not in the mood at all yeah. to argue with you about the epistemology <laughs> of this. Okay. I think... That's precisely what it is. I would yeah. normally, yeah. Um, but I'm not in the mood because I think there's more important things to do in life right now, especially in my life and probably in yours, which is to, to for me, I think what you're telling me is a narrative, which I happen to like. Mm. Mm. I happen to like it. Totally, yeah. And I have been living my life according to it, more or less, or trying to. And I have found some good results from it by being compassionate toward others, by being what is called empathetic toward others, by doing what is called helping others. The podcast has been very much about that. And Renegade University has been very much about that. And building these projects and the people I'm meeting and the relationships I'm establishing and literally helping people in various ways and being helped, by the way, by lots and lots of people being helped. Lots of people have helped me. That's the world I have entered with this compassion thing you've been talking about, with this empathy thing you've been talking about. I'll accept those names, those categories, those concepts. I do believe they're just fictions. I do believe it's just narrative, but I happen to like it. Mm. So I'm sticking with it. So we'll leave it at that. How okay. about that? But, you know, cool? All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's funny thinking again about ideas. And so one, one of the more powerful ideas I ever came across was in uh, Leibniz. Mm -hmm. um, all I ever read was the monadology. And if, for people out there, he's impossible. I, I, no, the monadology is you can find it online. It's so it's hard. It's 90 propositions, goes from one to 90. <laughs> it's only about five pages long. It is the most beautiful psychedelic oh, really? like, lucid thing in the world. Yeah. Oh. You will just, it's like the most beautiful. Bor Borges was a real Leibnizian, just okay. these little games. And so, the, 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 as a quick aside, the monadology begins with the very first line is there are simples we call monads. And the second one is hmm. we know that there are monads, we know there are simples because there are compounds. So ready, his logic is a mm -hmm. pure tautology. It's a self-contained world. <laughs> In the very middle of it, he talks about the lake. And within the lake, there's an infinite number of 
uh, other lakes that are the same lake. And within that lake, it's infinite lakes. And within that lake, it's infinite lakes. Uh -huh. And then it ends with the perfect harmony of all things under God's perfect rule, which is what Deleuze will call the Baroque. Just everything works out. Everything finds its place. But the figure there is that um, is the plenum, right? So for Leibniz, the world is full. It's full of itself, right? And in fact, this is a big debate. In I, You're the historian, but mm -hmm. I know that there's a famous book uh, about this debate between Thomas Hobbes and Boyle. I don't know what his first name was, but whether it's a vacuum or not. Mm -hmm. or is there such thing as nothing or is the world full? Between right now I'm sitting across from Thaddeus, is there something between us or not? Or let's say even between the molecules, is there nothing? And Leibniz and Thomas Hobbes argue, no, it's full. There is no such thing as an empty space. And the vacuum is one. So Boyle invented the vacuum, so he had a commercial interest. Uh, but of course, that's what science became premised on. Let's perform experiments <laughs> in a no place, okay. right? Which always struck me as nihilistic. Yeah. I'm gonna know the truth because I took it out of all conditions of life mm -hmm. and put it in a no place and then I know something about it. Right. It seems insane. That's literally the definition of nihilism. Right. Um, but the plenum, here's my point, the plenum is this great figure for me because it's fullness that's always full. doesn't mean, and it, however big it is, it's just, it's just full of itself. So I picture the universe as a plenum and it, it can grow and expand, contract and expand, but it's always full. It never is too full. It's never overflowing. Mm -hmm. it, and it's never lacking. There is no lack. So if the world is in fact a plenum, which is what I believe. The space between us, we are of a continuous fabric. Merleau-Ponty, a great phenomenologist, calls this the flesh, mm -hmm. the flesh of the world. We are of the same stuff. I can only be seen. I can only see you because I'm something that can be seen, which undoes all of enlightenment, objectivity, and scientific claims. Merleau-Ponty's epistemology is I can only know the world precisely because I'm continuous with the world, not because I'm separate from it. Boom. That's Daniel Coffeen. Fucking A, that's a good one. Yeah. So my point is we're all, we're, the plan in between us, I, that's the grounds of what I'm calling empathy, which is not feeling as you feel, but feeling with you. Ah. That's what I'm ah. suggesting. Okay. Right. So I put out a feeling, you recognize it, or you put out a feeling that you feel is somewhat parallel, perhaps. Maybe that's the word. Yeah, just, yeah. And then if I, and if I then feel like you're parallel, then we can move forward together. Is yeah. that, or, you know, yeah, it's not what's always going on. We read people, we, yeah. we, we, we're reading, we're responding to affect all the time, but affect to me is the great missing figure in, in modern epistemology in knowledge. Yeah. We don't consider it knowledge. Exactly. But it is the main knowledge of the world. Feelings, emotions, affect. Is what yeah, you're talking so about. the yeah. feelings and emotions are subsets of affect. Affect is weirder than right, that. Right, it's right, cosmic, right. it's strange, the weird mood of the day. Sure. You wake up, I don't, what's going on? Why does it feel this way? Mm -hmm. It's just this, it's always happening. The world is affective. It's you not can't neutral. You can't measure it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's distinctly always that which is qualitative. It's what modernists cannot deal with. Exactly. It's what modernists cannot deal with. Let me it, say that again. There's no place in their formula for it. Exactly. This, was my, this was my father, the engineer, the computer scientist. Yeah. He just couldn't deal with it. He couldn't handle it. It's what people who are known as being on the spectrum or having Asperger's can't deal with. But it's really what most people can't deal with, especially people in politics, especially people in academia. It's people the academia. who It's the same conversation we were having. Who work yeah. with ideas. They yeah. tend to not be able to deal with this because they're so busy professionalizing, systematizing, reducing things to numbers. Yeah. And so that they can stack them, count them, sort them, build them. And right? I think one, I think you, you talk a lot about feelings and emotions, which are very psychological. But mm -hmm. what I like about affect as a meta figure is that it's a human hmm. and it's interpersonal. It streams through us. You walk in a restaurant, you walk in a bar, we could both be like, the mood in here is weird. Well, what's that? Yeah. I don't like the mood in here. We right. say that kind of shit all the time. Right. The vibe. Yeah. And I always, you know. What's the vibe? Yeah. yeah. How do you know that? How do you know that? W what's the vibe between zero and 10? Exactly. Is it big, small? You can't measure. It's you not can't, measured. It's purely big. qualitative. And yet yeah. we live so much, maybe all of our lives, maybe every decision, probably every decision is determined at least in part by affect. Yeah. Yet we have no way to reckon with it, to, to incorporate it into our way of thinking, yeah. to, as I said, measure it to any, right? Yep. There you go. Yep. It's like, that's, that was my feeling as an academic all those years. I was like, yeah. wait a minute, yeah. there's this massive world all around us and no one seems to care or even know that it exists. It's like Truman in the bubble, the Truman show, that movie, yeah. Yeah. there's this little town, you know, in this little bubble and no one even knows that there's this massive world of lives of people who work for a living as auto mechanics, who, yeah. who are firefighters, who, 
who are, you know, who die when they're twenties, who are drug addicts, who are all these things that we were, we were shielded from as these coddled little upper middle class academics in these beautiful little ivory towers. Yeah. I found out since I got kicked out about 10 years ago that there is this whole world and it yeah. actually turns out to be way more interesting, really painful and hard, yeah. but my goodness, I've gotten a whole new education about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're going to build something new. We're yeah, going to we try yeah, we because are. we don't like that place yeah. and we have things to talk about that they don't know how to talk about. So we're going to build a place where we talk about ideas and affect. Yeah. We talk about the big, sophisticated, abstract concepts that Nietzsche wrote about, but we connect them immediately to pain, suffering, joy, happiness, yeah. feelings. I love, you know, affect as knowledge is one of my main obsessions, you know, the last 20 years. And it's really actually mostly since leaving the academy. I got turned on to it through Deleuze, talks a lot about it, hmm. but I didn't really get it. Hmm. Because I hadn't been evacuated, I hadn't been vulnerable mm -hmm. yet, I hadn't been open, and finally it began to dawn on me. And the fact is, every day I'm still trying to understand it, you know. And and I'll say certain things have um, I've done my whole life, but have come back to me in the role they've played. I think psychedelics are great, and I think pot is incredible because what happens is you're sitting in the room and all of a sudden you're super sensitive to affective flow. Yes. And you start, and, and that for me, that translates a lot into social anxiety in a room. Like you get uh, everyone noticing that I'm feeling weird. Right. And that's what pot is great for. It, it is per, the perception of the affective field, which is always there. You're not making it up. It's not huh. hallucination to me is a misnomer or it suggests something that's not there. When for me, hallucination even DMT hallucination, even super visual hallucination is actually seeing something that's there you don't normally see because you're blinded by what you'll call modernism. I don't know the right words for it, but you open with this thing of vulnerability and we come back to affect and the academy and, yeah. and, the, and, the, and the sort of systematic eradication our culture has for these things. And now mm. I understand better. I was giving you sort of some shit for wanting to talk about this, but now mm. I see you're looking for, you're making, building an argument. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... Personally, I think you psychologize it. I don't want you to psychologize okay. it so much, right? Good. I yes. like a more impersonal, cool. more a human, more hmm. interhuman, more hmm. like this other thing, right? The psychology of it is important. I, not to hmm. eliminate that at all. Mm -hmm. I, we agree on that, mm -hmm. right? It's, but it's situated in a lot of other weird shit, right? I mean, just, I, I call it cosmic, and I know everyone thinks I'm just a psychedelic hippie, but I truly mean it. I, I'm looking out right now. Look outside that fucking window, San Francisco, mm -hmm. such a moody city, mm -hmm. and you know, a friend of mine great poet wrote a great uh he wrote a poetry textbook so he's so my friend is this great poet who really believes in affect as knowledge so first he wrote a dictionary in which it leads with affect so mm. it defines words but rather than the traditional dictionary which eliminates affect all speaks in a monotone he wrote a dictionary in which every word is defined according to it so the def and it has a full definition full pronunciation but the definition for gleeful is gleeful. Mm. The definition for bleak is bleak. Acrobatic lands its plants its landing. You mm -hmm. know, purple is really purple. Mm -hmm. um, foreplay is you know ends with a colon. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it only you could only do about fifty <laughs> words because they were so exhausting. But it was a dictionary, and he uh, says this is. I want to introduce affect into how we understand words, and then he wrote a second book, again a book of poetry, but it's a textbook called Atmospherics. In which he says what we call atmospherics are the, the logic of the atmosphere, the logic of affect hmm. as knowledge. And he breaks it into a series of categories and examples. And he wrote, wrote as a textbook. Wow. That's you. That's you. That sounds like you. Well, he and I studied. Think, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, he's, that's, I taught his books and he's, we studied together. Affect, affect we, we is knowledge. We came out of rhetoric together. Affect yeah. is data. Yes. Right? That's what you're saying? Data. Yeah. yeah. I highly recommend more. Or, or it can books. be data. Yeah. You can use it. You can, yes. you can talk about it, work with it, use it, deploy it. Yeah. And in fact, when you don't like other, incorporate like it, other evidence. You're missing. So such as with words. Right. I had my first year teaching um, comp. I had a student who was, I was the TA and the the instructor had given them um, Martin Luther King speech, some Martin Luther King speech to read. Of course. And he said, do a rhetorical analysis. Mm -hmm. And the student wrote, well, the, Martin Luther King uses eclectic sources to appeal to a wide variety of audiences. And I circled the word eclectic. And I said, it's not really the right word. You mean a variety, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. and, he, and he went, he was, but he went bananas because he'd always gotten A's. Uh -oh. He was like two years older than him at the time. 
but he didn't understand affect. Eclectic is not quite right, right? We can call it, you know, connotation versus denotation. It's not quite right. It's a little hodgepodgey. You mean he's strategically deploying a variety mm -hmm. of things, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to understand words, how can you understand words without talking about affect and the way they perform themselves, right? One of his great examples, Lauren's great examples, is, you know, abbreviated. Is you know, feels like a bird pecking at something it should have gotten the first time. It's a very long word for abbreviation, mm -hmm. right? Because it feels like a bird <laughs> pecking at something, but you got to know that and you feel through that. And right. how can you make a good writer who only understands the meaning of something, but doesn't understand the sense of something? So when we want to build a bridge, what do we do with this? Well, same with that. Same, you know, designers now, uh, uh, you know, with so-called design thinking. Aha, it's not a, there it is, right. Begins re entering our mentality, right? right. You look, at, look at the That's fucking Golden Gate Bridge That's and tell right. me they didn't think about affect. Of course, of course, of course, okay. You know, course. and then you see some idiotic bridge and you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. There's pure engineers. They didn't take into consideration flow and feeling and sensation. That's it. Of course. Yeah. Of course, right? Architects, I mean, that's, that's the great architects. Yeah. Yeah. Even rocket ships, you know, they put decorations on them, don't they? Yeah. They and make and, them look and it looks cool. Way. That's right. And if you want to feel cool, and, uh, That's of right. course you do. Mm -hmm. it was, you it's know? not just to get to the moon. And it's because you don't want to separate. The goal here is not to say affect is not the veneer and it's not only affect. Nice. It's, things it's, and affect are they're all in a wound with inseparable. each other. Inseparable. Is that the word? Okay. Yeah. You know, Merleau-Ponty calls them inter, intertwined. Intertwined, yeah. Yeah, because of the chiasm. Mm -hmm. There's a, he calls it the intertwining of the visible and the in, his, has a, the title of his book is the visible and invisible, mm -hmm. and, it, and the great essay in that book, his most famous one, is called the chiasm, the intertwining, right? I only see you because you see me, right? I'm only I'm I can only be seen because I'm something that can see and vice versa. Um, the visible and the invisible, the affect and the body, they're separate. We can talk about them separately, but they're intimately intertwined, always moving through and around each other in all kinds of ways. Right. Yeah. I just talk about these things as choices rather than the way you talk about them, which sounds more like they're determined. Um, but that's okay. I don't need to go there. It just, it doesn't yeah. matter. I don't to think me they're right opposed. I think, we, yeah, eventually we'd get, it just it. doesn't matter yeah, yeah, in the yeah. way that we live and our, yeah. have a friendship and, you know, do things yeah. together or whatever yeah. it is. I don't care. To um, me, the decision is the point at which you decide to lean in, fight, negotiate yeah. the affect, right? Yeah. Like, do I, Think about the day you wake up and the days of San Francisco is a very moody city. That's what I was going for. Lauren Green calls this city atmospheric, San Francisco. It's, mm. You feel its atmosphere. It's more than any other city I've ever been in or a place I've been in. Moods sweep through the city. And all of a sudden, everyone's being weird. Traffic gets weird because the weather is so intense here. We're so like in, in the sky. The fog is, is the sky. It's clouds. Yeah. We live in the clouds here. Right. right. And it changes. What's well, funny because the Bay Area... <laughs> It, the weather changes radically every single day because of the fog rolling in. And it's this very dramatic thing where the fog comes where you're living. It comes right over the hills here. Mm -hmm. And it's this super, if you've ever been here, you know what I'm talking about, right? At sunset, every single day, it's this new thing. Now, hang on though. That's a, that's an easy, cheap example because yeah. San Francisco is so obviously dramatic with right. Golden, the Golden Gate Bridge and the fog coming in. Yeah. What I was thinking about when you were talking about place and, and a sense of self was all the times I have spent staring out a car window or a train window or a bus window at some bleak looking neighborhood or landscape when I'm driving through America and thinking, oh my God, these poor people who live here and oh my God, I could be living here one day and oh my God, it's, it gets, it feels like it's inside of me suddenly and I feel as bleak and as, de as desolate as the Arizona desert. Mm. Now, that's what James Baldwin, I believe, was talking about. I don't have a home inside of me, so right, I right. always feel homeless and I'm always vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. There's your word, vulnerable. Not in a good way. I'm vulnerable to the outside. Whatever is outside the external world is just going to determine how I feel inside if I have no home built for me. It's, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I, I one thing I, 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 an exercise I like to do sometimes that I recently been thinking that I should tell some people some of these exercises because they're kind of nice exercises. Mm -hmm. Something called an affect walk, mm. you know, kind of get it from the idea of a color walk. You know, the surrealist would use. No. What's this? Leave the house, choose a color. Classic thing, right? Choose a color, cool. blue. Just rather than having a destination, follow blue. The house is blue up there. I see blue there. And, just, and you find yourselves in weird parts of the city, right? Huh. And, you, and you begin to see blue differently. Because uh -huh. you begin to see all these different variations. Some blue, affect walks, right? And, you know, I, I, a little bit of pot helps. And it's legal <laughs> here in California, so we can talk about this. Uh -huh. um, a little 
Beds, I guess, could still come in buses, but it doesn't need pop, but it helps. Right, you don't need pop. Pop's really you effective. But you don't need it. You don't need it. I love this. Affect walks. Yeah, just go and just everything. You walk by a house, that garden, that those steps there, the way they're rugged, the, the overgrownness of this yard, the feeling of this one. You walk by this next one, it's all prim and proper. Maybe a little, up t- whoops, maybe a little uptight, and then you walk by this next one, and you begin to feel, lean into it, this tree versus that tree. Feel into how a tree Fucking A. I mean, remember my first acid trip, I ended up in all these conversations with trees. And one ended up in Philly with this tree that told the best joke, man, this ginkgo tree. It was just hilarious. I still think about that joke. Okay, hard to say it, but I see it in my head so clearly. Every tree is so different. And I, San Francisco is great like that. You go to Golden Gate Park and there's such internal variation in the city mm-hmm. that not everything always has. Right. But So it's hard to find maybe in certain areas. But, um, you know, the desert tends to affect tends to pervade over a greater space hmm. in a city it's easy there's endless variation mm-hmm. this door that door that paint the, all of a sudden the sky change the weird mode the weird way roads intersect you know i live right near the freeway here it's like yeah. you're crossing cars are exiting and ends. yeah you know and it's yeah. like wow this is a little weird right here yeah when you're high you notice all that stuff right so the engineer looks at it entirely differently exactly. entirely differently exactly. the world is totally different than the way you're looking at it in but those they, to me, they sh- a good engineer, it's the same thing. It's the flow of bodies and the flow of affect. Right. And they, and they in, inflect each other. When I said engineer, I mean, I mean like the engineers who actually no, engineered yeah, the, yeah, the freeways yeah. around here who pro- I'm sure had zero in mind yeah. except for getting the freeway to work correctly, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, maybe. I don't know. Actually, maybe they did have some affect. I mean, maybe they curved it around this hill because it had a view, right? When yeah. you drove around there. Maybe. Who knows? But generally speaking, engineers are unable and unwilling. Yeah to consider affect as a data point. Yeah, I mean, that's, we saw this in the rise of um, the rise of the internet, right? And it's happening right now with the, with, in the blockchain world where everything leads with a certain notion of what's true. So developers, no, I've, I've had to deal with engineers my whole life as a branding guy, mm-hmm. you know, and they're all starting these companies. They think their product, this, it just works for itself. I'm like, yeah, you still have fucking feeling and you, you, you still something, there's an experience there. Yeah, your work. There's you're, no pure productivity. Your whole post-academic career yeah. as a branding consultant is all about affect. That's all it's it a is. Thousand yeah. percent, yeah, and that's what makes capitalism run. You dumb shits. Exactly. You think it's just your coders? If it's just your coders, well, then let them make the product, and yeah. of course, the product will sell itself, dumbasses. But instead, you spend half your budget or more on people like Daniel Coffin to tell you how to feel about stuff. Yeah. And how consumers are going to feel about stuff, and how the market's going to feel. Right. It's all about feelings. Yeah. Actually, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Exactly. And Steve Jobs was one of the few who understood this. Yeah. That's what I was about to say. So you had the early world, and they think that the internet was just, and the, and, and the computational was pure function. Ones, ones and zeros. And instead, you, what you had was that, like a dictionary, you had this monotone affect that was unbearable. Totally. And the, so the idea of no affect is itself an affect. Yes. That's sort of unpleasant. Yes. That privileges certain people. Mm-hmm. It privileges the people who feel that way. But for the rest of it, it's unbearable. Steve Jobs, exactly. He, he's like, you know what? There's a lot of other people who want to interact with the computational who have different feelings. And he did pretty well. He did fucking yeah. He, he, he brilliant. He turned it all from speeds and feeds into blue versus green. He made yeah. he made people have feelings for yeah. their computers. Yeah, for a device. It's Do brilliant. you not know people who have feelings about Apple? Who identify with Apple? Who yeah. put the put the logo on their bodies on their cars? Yeah. I have lots of super smart friends who are Apple people. Their identities are partly merged with it, but they have some feeling. It feels good. It looks good. It, yeah. Right. He yeah. understood affect. Yeah. And he, he made, led with it. And he, he became the it. leader yeah. of the whole industry. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to do is build a new world. Renegade University is just the beginning, but it's going to have not a single campus. It's not going to have one place where all the people come and the wise men speak down to the students. It's going to be multiple places. It's going to be in real life, so-called brick and mortar places, or it could be just on a patch of dirt under a tree like Socrates. It's going to be certainly online. It's going to be nebulous in that way, but it's going to be identifiable. We're going to have an ethos, mm-hmm. not a morality, but a way of being yeah. around each other, Yeah, which I think you and I are kind of sketching out here. Yeah. Completely. So I've been, that's what I've been doing for months now, building this yeah, Reagan guys. University and Unregistered yeah. Media yeah. is finding people who are down with this way of being and then establishing what, what I'm calling outposts all around so far North America, but maybe even further. And people are doing it because there's 
you could call it a market or you could call it a bunch of people who simply are dissatisfied with their lives and want something else. They want to get out of the institutions and the places and even sometimes the families and the houses they're living in. And they want to be with others like us who can talk about these things with them. Yeah. So that's what we're up to. We're going to have multiple nodes or, or places or outposts or campuses, whatever you want to talk about, whatever you want to say about that. But that's, we need to have no barriers, no boundaries. It's tribalism without borders is yeah. what I'm looking for. Yeah, I think you should, I, I, I've gotten very, very excited. The more I've known you, more since introducing me to this and to the possibilities of this Redigate University. And you've seen me on social media talking more and more about it. And I haven't gotten in deep yet um, because I don't know why. Just yeah, well, we just started. Yeah. You just recorded. Yeah. Yeah. You, just, you just recorded. Uh, so people know. A lot of people know. But you just recorded a video for us. A course, a video course lecture on Nietzsche, which is totally amazing and brilliant. Every time I look at it, it makes me smile and happy. We're going to be uh, releasing that really soon once we launch the the new platform, which is imminent. But yeah, so that's we're just beginning this this journey. It's just I'm so I just feel so lucky that. I don't know how the hell I found you. I mean, I do know, but it's just kind of like well, I'm, almost my reverse doppelganger. Also, like you grew up in, in New York. I grew up here. And then but then we spent our adult lives in each other's hometowns. Yeah, and funny? now That's we've funny. met back here and we it's funny. The weird comedy beginning. Oh, we had a fair. This yeah, weird, we both started off as weird, red diaper babies. Yeah. And it's but just, the, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky because I'm so reclusive that I don't find anybody. I got to wait to be plucked and you plucked me, which was I plucked you, like, baby. Sure is. Yeah. And I got lucky with Doug Lane too. I mean, it's various people. Yeah. It's because of uh, Doug that I met you for sure. And it all happened because UC Berkeley, not my department, the engineers decided uh, they wanted to be podcasting classes. They saw my class was popular and big. They came to me and said, can we podcast your class? That's right. And it became like this hot, it's on and iTunes. It, became, it was the number one download, maybe. That's right. It's, they and, took it off iTunes because the department doesn't want me up there anymore. But, um, those lectures, they were they were great. I'm not gonna lie, and I, yeah. I listen to them now, and they, I don't identify anymore with that. It, it I identify as a witness now. It's like mm -hmm. that was I was lit up. Pretty cool. Yeah, they're pretty good. But yeah, it was an accident, you know. And then, and then Doug and I got the book and all this various stuff. Maybe right? maybe that hippie shit is all true. What you were telling me, this cosmic shit. Right, we baby. all end up where we're gonna end up, and everything's okay. Yeah. Not everything is going to be okay. That's a medallion I have on my desk to calm me down when I panic. No, it's everything you're saying to me is okay. Absolutely, yeah. You promise? Necessarily. <laughs> you guarantee it, Daddy? I guarantee it. It's always already guaranteed. <laughs> exactly, man. Okay, I think I can feel better. I do feel better. Right. I do feel so much better than I did three hours ago. I'm not yeah. kidding you. I was in a pretty bad place, and I almost... I had a hard time coming here because that, that essay ripped me open, man. And now I feel like I can move forward. Okay. See, postmodernism is useful, kids. <laughs> Stick around. You'll find out. <laughs> hey, thanks for doing this, man. Yeah, and uh, and we're going to do this again and again. Yep. And I can't wait to unleash you on the world. Uh, very kind. This is really wonderful. I'm honored. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To support the show and become a member of the Unregistered community, go to unregisteredlisteners.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>